Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. I am Holly Baker, podcast producer for the University of Central Florida's History Department. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Dr. Boyd Murphy, the project manager for the University of Florida Smathers Library's Florida Family and Community History Project. Before the interview with Dr. Boyd Murphy, you will hear a short interview with Dr. Daniel Murphy, Associate Professor and Assistant Editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly. Could you please introduce yourself for the audience? Sure, my name is Dan Murphy. I'm an Associate Professor of History here at UCF. Um, this year I'm also a um, faculty fellow in a uh, faculty excellence unit of UCF. You've been producing the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast for a long time now. Do you remember when you started? Um, I first came to UCF in 2010, and I think shortly after that, I think a couple of months after that, I did my first podcast interview. And yeah, I, I guess I did my last one last academic year, so it's been eight or nine years, eight years, I guess. Um, a long time. But it's been a fun learning experience, so um, uh, no complaints. Tell me about coming to UCF from the University of Texas, Tyler, uh, to take a position with the Florida Historical Quarterly? Well, it was, it, in some ways it was, it was a dream, in some ways it was a, a nervous kind of experience. Um, I had been reviewing books, I'd been book review editor for the um, FHQ at UT Tyler for about two years before um, I came out here, or came to Orlando. Um, and I had really enjoyed that. And then just a series of circumstances allowed me to come out here. And I was really, really pleased. I'd always, um, I published in the FHQ. I'd always been an avid reader of it. So to work with it and to work with the editor, Connie Lester, it was, it was like I said, kind of a dream come true. And it was a big transition. You know, I'd been in Texas for about nine years. Um, I tried to teach, get people interested in Florida history there. They didn't seem to be that interested, oddly enough. So it was good to actually come to a place where um, my, my research is on in Florida. And so I'm working with uh, the premier journal on Florida history. I, I couldn't think of a better scenario at that point. Yeah, the Florida Historical Quarterly is an amazing, well-respected publication, that's for sure. And I'm glad to be working here as well. <laughs> um, how did you transition into producing the FHQ podcast? Well, when I got here, um, one of my colleagues, Robert Casanello, he was doing it. And I, I think maybe uh, Connie Lester had done one or two herself. And he just he asked me about the, the idea, introduced me to it. I didn't really know much about podcasts at that point. I certainly didn't have the technical knowledge that he had. But I said, sure, you know, I can talk to people. I quickly learned it was a little more complicated than, than I thought. And I had to kind of uh, get over my fears, get over my shyness to an extent. But it was, it was pretty seamless. Or once he asked me to do it, he never um, offered to do it himself again. So I kind of just became the person that did it, which was fine because I enjoyed it. But it, it, I, I didn't really expect that to happen. Um, and I certainly didn't expect to do it this long. But like I said, it was a good experience because I learned a lot about a different way to um, teach Florida history. You get people interested in it. And I figured that was that was well worth it, if nothing else. Absolutely. And actually, the podcast wave, you kind of started uh, making podcasts whenever they were, they started to become extremely popular. And the wave continues. And people are getting a lot of their information from podcasts nowadays. So Yes. And just, just one more plug for FHQ. I remember that Dr. Casanello and the FHQ were using podcasts to disseminate history in a different way long before most people were, including most of the major national and international historical organizations. So in many ways, the FHQ is a trendsetter, a pace setter here when it comes to podcasts. And now we're part of the old guard, I think, um, in, in a lot of ways, which is, you know, that that's a, a tribute to Dr. Castanellis, a tribute to the FHQ, to UCF, everybody involved. They were really looking ahead and they, they rode the wave, I think, like you said. It's true. I wonder, can you tell me what did you learn from producing podcasts for the Florida Historical Quarterly? Oh wow, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I guess the, the simple answer is I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how to communicate with people about history in a forum that I typically hadn't done before, or actually had never done before I was doing podcasts. I learned that talking to authors about their work in a conversational setting is often as effective in getting people interested in their broader work uh, than anything else I'd ever done. Um, I frankly had fun talking to a lot of these people that I had known through their research, I'd known on the page, I'd seen the written word, I'd heard of them, I knew their reputation, 
But um, actually talking to them made them human. It made them, it personified them. It, it gave them humanity. And in that regard, I think I was able to really ask questions that I thought would benefit me and also benefit the audience. So I could go on and on telling you the things I learned. Um, I also learned a lot about myself, a lot about my voice and what I thought my voice sounded like and what it really sounded like. I learned a lot about the nuts and bolts of recording. It's not as easy as you might think it is. On the other hand, it's also not, you know, necessarily a brain surgery. It's it's just using a new form of technology to really disseminate history, which is, if you're a historian, that's what you do. That's what you're supposed to do. I learned that this is a great way to get more people interested in history. Wonderful. Um, what did you enjoy most about producing podcasts for the FHQ? Well, I think the best part of the experience is I got to interact with uh, historians, scholars that I would not have been able to otherwise. And I got to do it in a, in a forum that I wouldn't have been able to. So I got to experience their knowledge and history in a way that was new to me. And once I figured that out, once I realized that, I wanted to help make that an experience for people listening as well. Which podcast episodes have stood out to you and why? That's an interesting question because uh, I was thinking back uh, recently about the different podcasts. And I've talked to a variety of different people. Most of the, the people have written articles in the quarterly. Um, others have guest edited. Occasionally, we'll, we'll do an interview. We did interviews at conferences, things like that. So, um, you know, I'll say so, so two things kind of lighthearted, I guess. You know, that I think one of the first ones I did stood out because when we recorded it, I couldn't necessarily tell at the time, but it turned out that someone we were interviewing had a cat in the room. And so every now and then you would hear a very um, soft meow. But it came through on the audio when we, we heard it. Didn't didn't ruin the interview or anything, but it, it actually made it quite funny, to be honest. Um, we've also had a couple interviews where the, the people interviewed had some spicy language that we had to edit out, and that was kind of interesting. Um, but the best ones, I think, were, were, were the interviews where we had a, an interview with the um, guest editors of the special issue. The FHQ recently concluded uh, several special issues kind of commemorating the 500th anniversary of uh, the discovery or the European discovery of Florida. And what these special issues did is the guest editors would come bring the best scholars on the topic together. And so when I would interview them, I was getting more than just an author's take on one article. I was getting an editor's take on the, the, the breadth of the articles included in the volume. And that was really interesting because it was almost like encapsulating in a 20-minute podcast um, a century of Florida history through the eyes of various historians who I knew were great scholars. I respected them a, a great deal. And I was getting to help get their scholarship out to audiences that might not be able to, or they'd be able to, but might not access it without hearing this podcast. And that was kind of rewarding because I ended up, we ended up interviewing all of the guest editors. So if you take all of those together, that was four or five or so um, different issues. You know, multiple scholars were, were being introduced to audiences that might not have heard of them before, but surely that led to more people reading their scholarship. And as far as Florida history is concerned, that, that was, you know, invaluable. That was something that I felt really proud of that, that we did. Well, I'll be the new host of the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. You're passing the baton to me, and I appreciate that. But I wonder, could you give me some advice as the new producer of the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast? Well, first of all, uh, the FHQ podcast is in great hands. You're going to do a great job. You're already very... Um, talented and well-known for doing podcasts in the uh, uh, Central Florida area, so I'm not worried about anything in terms of going down in quality. It's probably going to improve a great deal. The main thing I would say, I guess, is be patient with yourself. Be patient with the people you're interviewing. And always remember that what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people that might not read the articles themselves interested enough through the conversation with the author or whoever you happen to be uh, interviewing to then say, hey, I'm ordinarily not interested in that kind of thing, but hearing that interview makes me want to read that article. If, if you achieve that every time, and it doesn't even matter the, the number of people that do it, if you get one person, 10 people, 100 people to do it, you have succeeded in getting more people uh, interested in Florida history and uh, researching it on their own. And I think, you know, you, you can't do more than that. Well, that's great. Well, I appreciate your work that you've done with the Florida Historical Quarterly. It's been wonderful getting to know you, and uh, thanks for the interview. You're welcome. In this next interview, Dr. Boyd Murphy and I discuss his article titled, As the General Lay Dying, 
The Diary of a Confederate Officer's Florida Odyssey, that was published in the Winter 2018 issue of the FHQ. Please introduce yourself for the audience. I'm Boyd Murphy. I work for the University of Florida's Strozier Library uh, in their uh, Digital Production Services Department. Um, my focus is on Florida family and community history, so I supervise that program where we're digitizing collections that deal with Florida history and community history in particular. In the most recent issue of the Florida Historical Quarterly, uh, in your article, you spoke about Charles Wood. Uh, could you tell me who was Charles Wood? Charles Wood was a young Confederate officer who spent some time in Florida in the fall of 1861 and in the winter of 1862. Um, he was originally from the Charlottesville, Virginia area. He attended the University of Virginia where he studied law. When the Virginia left the Union, he enlisted in the Confederate Army, fought uh, in one of the early campaigns in the western part of Virginia and through family connections was able to get out of that terrible campaign. He talks about it in his diary, uh, and he was able to get an assignment to Florida where he served as the executive officer to General John B. Grayson, who was in charge of Florida's defenses at that time. So his diary is of particular interest to Florida history and Florida Civil War history, obviously, because he is in Tallahassee observing decisions that are being made there, uh, meeting with Governor Milton and other uh, officials. And uh, he left Florida, ended up fighting uh, at the Battle of Antietam where he was captured, he was released. Uh, he ended up the war in North Carolina where he surrendered with um, Confederate armies there. And then of course went back to Virginia um, where he was an attorney and a farmer and lived a long life uh, until the 1930s where he died at age 94. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about his diary. Um, what sort of details does the diary reveal about Charles Wood's personal life and his experiences during the Civil War? You might be interested in how I came about uh, you know, finding this diary and uh, studying it and then of course turning it into an article. Uh, really starts back when I was working on my dissertation, which was a study of comparative study of Florida and Georgia during the Civil War. And I was focused on Governor Milton, of course, as governor of Florida uh, and Governor Joseph Brown of Georgia. And in looking for more sources on Governor Milton, I was surprised to learn that I couldn't find a copy of his inaugural address. And I, at this time, when I was working on my dissertation, I was also a full-time archivist for the State Archives of Florida and Tallahassee. And, you know, of course, went through all the sources there and looked at old newspapers and just didn't find anything bearing on his inaugural address because we have inaugural addresses for all the other governors of Florida. And then I, uh, a friend of mine who is a graduate student at Florida State mentioned that he came across a citation to this Charles Wood diary, which was at the University of Georgia. And in the citation, it mentions that he was present in Tallahassee at the time that Milton was inaugurated. So I thought, well, maybe there's something in this diary about the inaugural address. And so I went to the University of Georgia, but was able to look at the original diary. This is several years ago before it's been digitized and put online. And he did mention the inaugural event, but nothing about the speech. All he did was comment on how good looking the young women were in Tallahassee. You know, the guy's 20 or 21 years old. So there wasn't much in the way of uh, political commentary about that aspect. But I read the rest of the diary and he did have a lot of great details about other things that were going on in Tallahassee and in Florida during the Civil War. So that's how I became uh, interested in the diary in the diary, it starts out in 1857 when he's a student at the University of Virginia. So most of the early pages of the diary deal with student life at Virginia. Uh, anybody that's interested in antebellum college life in the South, this would be a great source for that research as well. He talks about his love for a young lady named Lizzie Benton. He spends a lot of pages talking about her. 
they dated, um, but eventually uh, split. He also talks about, of course, the secession of Virginia following the attack on Fort Sumter uh, and Lincoln's calling up of volunteers and Virginia leaving the Union. And he and a lot of the other young college students joined the Confederate forces in Virginia and participated in some of the early campaigns, as I mentioned earlier there in the western part of Virginia, what would be West Virginia today, and he describes in detail just how terrible the conditions were weather-wise and lack of supplies, and of course, people that know anything about Civil War history, when they hear the name Robert E. Lee, they think of his success in battle uh, in the early years of the Civil War. They may not know that he was in command of this expedition in the western part of Virginia, and it was a total disaster for him as well as for his army. So young Charles Wood wanted to get out of that uh, theater as quickly as possible, and through family connections, his father and one of his cousins who was working for the Confederate government, he was able to go to Richmond where he learned that he had received an appointment as the executive officer aide de camp to General John B. Grayson, who had been assigned to command the defenses of Florida. Um, and so my article in the quarterly talks about as the general lay dying, and it really not only focuses on Wood's comments about what's going on politically, but the fact that Grayson, when he was assigned to Florida, was dying already of tuberculosis or consumption, as they called it back then, kind of symbolic of, I think, in a way, the fact that you know Florida was kind of the last priority as far as the Confederacy was concerned. They were focused on defending Virginia, Tennessee, and other places, and so Florida really, you know, received very little in the way of supplies and support from the Confederacy. And this kind of dark atmosphere is reflected in the diary. So Wood talks about General Grayson and uh, uh, his relationships with him, even though Grayson didn't live very long. He died a couple weeks after uh, Wood arrived uh, in Tallahassee. He also gives details about um, Governor Milton and other personalities in Tallahassee, and obviously the diary reveals, you know, a good portion of Wood's personality. He's a young man. He is. Uh, he joined the Confederate Army, but earlier on in the diary, he was in no way a secessionist. He hoped for a compromise solution that the South would not break away from the rest of the country. So he is a uh, loyal Confederate, but not. Uh, an enthusiastic secessionist or fire eater. You know, he just wants to get do his job. You know, hopefully this Confederacy will win, but he is in no way you know, some super Confederate patriot. And uh, those views are reflected in the diary. Just to reiterate one point about Florida, I think a lot of people that you know live in Florida today are probably surprised that Florida was in the Civil War. And so I think the more that we can bring these primary sources to life to let people know that Florida was in the war, there weren't major battles here, but people fought and suffered here just like in any other state uh, during the war. And Grayson was in charge of Confederate defenses from the Apalachicola River over to the Atlantic. And Wood goes into some detail about that, talking about just how you know, pitiful these defenses were and that... Uh, the Confederate government is basically ignoring uh, Florida. So there is good detail about that. And the Civil War in general, I think in the earlier pages when he's talking about his concerns about secession and what's going to happen, um, which would have been a common uh, train of thought for a lot of people at that time, but it's always interesting to see the actual comments of somebody who was living through those events. I think that insight into the campaign in Virginia, even though it's not Florida, it's part of his story, uh, and showing that, you know, people like Robert E. Lee were, obviously, we you know, he wasn't successful later on in the war, but earlier in the war, he also had some uh, major setbacks. And a really fascinating part of the diary is his journey from Richmond down to Florida. And so he describes that. And so, 
in my article, the first part of it is kind of an overview of Wood and his time in Virginia. And then what I did is transcribe the parts of the diary that deal directly with his journey to Florida and his stay in Florida itself. So it's a transcription of that diary and, of course, you know, gives you details and footnotes about the people he encountered and their biographical details and events and so forth. And so I think it's also a good perspective on, you know, kind of a, a road trip, if you will, in, uh, in the Confederacy, coming down from Richmond to Florida, commenting on people that he meets. Uh, he, you know, was a well-to-do young man, and part of the diary I talk about, he, uh, well, he talks about meeting, you know, regular soldiers on the train, and he's kind of contemptuous of them and their crude manners. But, of course, those soldiers were would have been contemptuous of an arrogant young officer. So I think you get some perspective on life in the Confederate Army. Um, so I think the diary, even though um, it's not huge, you know, it's uh, compared to some other Civil War diaries in terms of length, it does give some really good perspective on those personal details and, of course, particularly what's going on in Florida. His sister, uh, Lucy, uh, she married a young man named Waddy Butler, who was from Fernandina. But Waddy had attended UVA, uh, and he was also serving in Virginia. Uh, Lucy Wood, uh, in her own right, was a diarist and a letter writer. And she talks about her brother Charles a bit in her diary, but her diary is a very important source for information about the Confederacy during the war. It's been used by several historians, the original, well, I don't think the original exists, but a photocopy is at the University of North Carolina. And so you get some insight into her as well in her brother Charles' diary. So I think that's interesting. So if people want to find other primary sources, her a diary would be a good source. She also mentions Florida. And I think it's interesting to note that, you know, Charles Wood lived until 1930. Um, unfortunately, he didn't keep his diary going after the war, uh, which would have been interesting given his longevity to see his uh, opinions and experiences, uh, you know, in Reconstruction and so forth. Um, but um, anyway, it's a diary that I'm glad has been brought to light, uh, and I'm really the responsibility for that is the University of Georgia, who has the, the institution that has the original diary, but they uh, have digitized it. So you can go to the University of Georgia library site. You can search for Charles Wood diary and you can read the original there uh, and, you know, in his handwriting, obviously. And um, I think it's fascinating to see, you know, the original document. Uh, I would recommend that to anybody who was interested in Florida and the Civil War or learning more about Charles Wood. Thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed and I enjoyed reading your article as well. Thank you. Appreciate it, Holly. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast.